All right, let's take our Bibles this evening and go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Kind of goes along with this morning's message. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I, brethren, did not speak unto you of the spiritual, but as in the carnal, even as in the babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth Thereupon, let me stop reading right there. Now, the church, of course, God's church. Now, you have, uh, I'm sure that there's various opinions on when the church started, but we do know the church was built upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We're to grow together as an habitation of the Spirit, according to the book of Ephesians. We are to be edified, we're to grow together, we're to come to unity uh, according to Ephesians chapter number 4. But there's one thing, there's a couple of things I want to share with you about the church tonight. First of all, the church and the family. And I love my family. It's difficult to see your family struggle. Now we, when we think about our family, we think about our sons and daughters, our wives and husbands and so forth. But we're part of the family. According to the Word of God, in verse number 1, 2, 3, and 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, the church is the family. And the goal is maturity. The goal is maturity. As we raise our children, we want to see them grow up and uh, be capable to face the world with an attitude, of course, of relying on the Lord Jesus Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But also we want our family right here at the Faith Baptist Church to grow. Amen. And the goal, of course, being a mature Christian. Now not only is the church a family and the goal is maturity, but in verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, the church is a field. And the goal is quantity. And I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but according to verse number 9 through verse number 23, the church is a temple and the goal is quality. We'll look tonight for sure at the church being the family and the church being the field. Now, Paul has already explained that there's two kinds of people in the world. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 and verse number 14, the Bible said, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So we have the natural man, and then according to verse number 15 of the same chapter, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So we have the natural man and the spiritual man, according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 14 and 15. Now he explains in chapter number 3 that there's two kinds of saved people. You have the mature Christian, and then you have the immature Christian. We talked a little bit about it at the men's meeting last night. And of course, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, they're called carnal. We have those that are filled with the Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 18. And then we have those that grieve the Spirit, 
according to Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 30, and those that quench the Spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 19. So we have two kinds of Christians, mature and immature, mature and carnal Christians. Now Paul claimed, did he not, to be a spiritual father. The fact is, let me just read a verse to you, right here in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians and verse 15. The Bible said, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now Paul spoke, of course, as a loving, concerned father. And he begins to reprimand or to reprove and to rebuke some of the babes and some of the division that's been going on here at the church of Corinth. Now, as we look right here again in the first four verses of chapter 3, we find the church is a family. And what a good family it is, what a great family it is to belong to. It's a royal family. We're sons and daughters of Abraham, and you and I both know that God doesn't make any junk, so we shouldn't talk about each other. Amen? Unless it's good. Everyone in the family is important to Almighty God. Now, uh, we talk about this matter of maturity. Now, as far as maturity and growth, we know that growth, if we're not careful, can be retarded in many ways. Now, first of all, we have those that are fleshly minded and carnal thoughts, unspiritual actions. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 6, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up uh, for one against another. And so there's those again that show fleshly actions, unspiritual actions. And just to mention a few that was going on here at the church of Corinth, there was a lot of jealousy going on, a lot of envy, and a lot of strife were in the ranks. There's too much evidence in this book presented not to come to this conclusion. If you'll notice back over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 11. The Bible said, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. That's a sad, sad bit of news for the Apostle Paul to get, especially after he spent so much time in Corinth trying to build and bring the brethren together in unity. A lot of contention going on. The Bible, according to verse number 11, verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? What's the implied answer? No! Christ is not divided. The body, therefore, should have no schism. It should not be divided. It should grow together in unity for a habitation, like we said in the book of Ephesians, for the Holy Spirit of God. Now, again, a lot of evidence here to prove that the church of Corinth had a lot, a lot of carnal people in it. In chapter number 3, as we've already read, he was addressing the immature, or the babies, if you will. In chapter number 5, he had to go as far as to uh, reprove uh, fornication within the ranks of so-called believers there in the church of Corinth. Chapter number 7, he spent a lot of time on dealing with marriage. There was a lot of people having marital problems, had preconceived ideas and notions about marriage. And then in chapter number um, 11, of course, there was a, and I could go on and on each chapter, but in chapter number 11, they had a problem with the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, the ordinances that God had left the church to perform till He come. And then in chapter 15, of course, they had a little problem with the resurrection. So there was a lot of things going on in the church of Corinth that should not be going on. And again, chapter number 1, verse number 11, he calls it contention. Well, if you'll notice in verse number 4 again, in chapter number 3, the Bible says, For while one said, I am of Paul, and another I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? And then in verse number 7, the Bible says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. A lot of people were trying to take credit 
of course, and being the line. Like they had a problem, a big problem, and in the church of Corinth with people wanting to stand in the limelight. They tried, now he told them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, especially chapter 14, to covet the best gifts. But the people at Corinth were trying to uh, participate in a gift and thereby misusing the gift and falsifying the gift in their own life when they tried to speak in tongues and healing and so forth like that. They just wanted to be in the limelight. So a lot of contention going on. But again, now let me just let me just switch gears just for a minute and I'll get back on the right track uh, as far as our thoughts go. But again, I find that a lot of people, a lot of Indian strife too comes from lost people. It's not always from saved people. Now baby Christians, of course, can cause a lot of problems uh, for the church and for the pastor. I understand that. But I understand this as well, that a lot of wolves in the church cause a lot of problems as well. We have wolves in the church, we have goats in the church, sheep are saved, goats are lost, and goats like to butt. There's some people sitting in the church building, in the church pews, that are basking in the sunshine of their own assumed salvation, trying to uh, operate the church like someone would operate the world, and it just doesn't work in God's business. Amen? Uh, it's a divine institution. God established it, and God's going to see it through. And we should perform, of course, by the gifts that He has given us. And there's a list again in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 that we are to find our gift and to exercise that gift in the edifying of the body of Christ. Now again, let me get back to back to where we're going here on the talking about immaturity and carnality in the life of a child of God. Now, uh, growth can be retarded by fleshly thoughts and actions and so on. Now, but there can be growth. There can be growth. And of course, God is the source of growth. The Spirit of God teaches us and directs us. How does He do that? With the Word of God. This is a real profound message tonight that we just need to stay in the Word of God. Amen. Read the Word of God. Make application. Amen. And we need to stay on our knees in prayer. How many times have you heard me say that this week? I think sometimes that we just need to be reminded of some things that we're prone to forget. And as long as I'm in this tabernacle, Peter said, I think it means as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in memory or putting you in remembrance of some of the things that you're prone to forget. So a very profound message tonight is stay in the Word of God. Read the Word of God every day. Don't raise your hand, but how many days this week already or last week? Because this is the first day of the week. How many days last week did you skip reading the Word of God? Well, I'll get into it Sunday. I'll get into it Wednesday night. Open your Bible every day. Amen. Have a planned time that you sit down, Amen. just you and God, and open the Bible. If it's just reading a chapter or a few verses, ask God to use it. And uh, now, I'm not big on one of these things. You know, you ever done this? God, give me an answer. Pluck out your eye. You know, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> no, what we need to do is get a planned reading schedule. Amen. Get you a good Bible reading schedule and stay with it. And apply those truths that you learn from the Word of God. So God is the source of growth. Carnal babes can grow in Christ. It's a matter of what you really want to do. Again, I said it kind of tied in with the message this morning. Whatever you want is what you'll get. What you put into this ministry is what you're going to get out of it. What you want in your Christian life, what you put in your Christian life is what you're going to get out of it. If you're an old sulky Eeyore, then that's exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get people that don't want to be around you, you won't have any friends. But if you read the Word of God and, and talking about the joy in, 1 John, or in John chapter 15, uh, you can have the joy of salvation. You can be a happy Christian whether you realize it or not. I know trials come and they come on time. They're never early and they're never late. But if you'll use those trials as windows, my friend, you can be a happy Christian. You can learn some lessons. So there's room for growth. Now, there's marks of maturity. There's two marks of maturity, as we find right here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. First of all, we've got a diet. A diet is milk and meat. Now, some say that milk represents the easy things in the Word of God, and meat represents the hard doctrine. 
Well, I gave uh, something in the men's meeting just to provoke your thinking. When we talk about milk and meat, uh, after reading a portion of Scripture over in Hebrews chapter 5, if you'll hold your place in uh, Col uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and go to Hebrews chapter 5 just for a moment. Hebrews chapter number 5. And this is just to provoke your thinking. I'm not telling you you have to agree with me on this. But uh, talking about this diet of milk and meat. The Bible said in verse number 11 of Hebrews chapter 5, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing and hear dull of hearing. For when, uh, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Now we know what the first principles of the oracles of God. We go to chapter 6, verse 1, it pretty well tells us, doesn't it? Now the Bible goes on to say there in verse 12, Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. There's a milk and meat again. That's the diet. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, milk, I believe, in this text, and you may again disagree, in 1 Corinthians as well, chapter number 3, uh, milk represents what Jesus Christ did on earth, the first principles of the oracles of God and so on, but meat is what Christ is doing in heaven as our intercessor. Did you know there's a lot more to salvation than just getting saved? Amen. Are y'all listening to me? There's a lot more to salvation than just trusting Christ for your Savior. But that's the most important thing you can do. That's the most important. And I know I'm going to be watching on YouTube and I'll be criticized maybe. Uh, but the most important thing tonight for you to do is to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're born into the family of God. Amen. When you're born in the family of God, the Spirit of God, He takes residence within you. And greater is He that is in you within the world, than He that is in the world. And He prompts you to go on. You see, but now what's happening today? Where is Christ today? Where is Christ today? He's within you, but where is the, the, the man Christ Jesus? He's at the right hand of the Father. What's He doing? <coughs> Making intercession for the saints. So don't you think that that's pretty important that we study the intercessory work of Christ? Amen. You see, that applies to what? His sanctification. Did you know the same grace that saves me, according to Titus, teaches me how to live God? So I think that meat is those people that are studying the Word of God on how they can be a good influence to other people. Amen. That's what I really believe. But a lot of people forget that and they begin to let these fleshly attitudes creep back in their life and you know what they need again? They need the first principles of the oracles of God. I'm not saying they need to get saved again. If you're saved, you're saved. You never lose your salvation. But there's a whole lot of Christians acting like lost people. And it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that. If, 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 if I could ever do anything as your pastor is to bring you from point A to point B. I love grace. I thank God for grace. I'm a grace preacher. I know I've been saved and I know it's by the grace of God. I know I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. And I'm going to heaven whether anybody likes it or not. But on my way to heaven, I sure would like to influence other people to go with me. Amen. And I believe that's that meat diet that you right. need to get in the Word of God and find out some, some principles and a little bit of morality in your life as a child of God to help others. Amen? Amen. And that's what Paul was rebuking. If you'll read it again and again and again, I don't think you can argue with the fact that that's what he was rebuking in the church of Corinth. There's a lot of fleshly attitudes. And he, wanted, he was telling people they ought to live like Christ. If you say you love Christ then live like Christ. Amen? Alright, now, uh, let's go on the second mark of maturity. We've got the diet. The first mark of maturity is the diet. You can pretty well tell, and I'm not saying that everybody should, it's their responsibility to go around judging people, but if you hang around somebody long enough, you're going to hear enough jesting and enough coarse things and enough things to know that this fellow's not a mature Christian. Then you're going to hear some things to say, this fellow knows what he's talking about. He's been reading the Word of God. He's been applying truths of the Word of God to his life. 
And if ever I needed advice, I need to go to this individual. How many people do you know like that? I hope you know several. I hope, and you can be one of those if you really want to. What you want is what you'll get. What you put into your Christian life is what you're going to get out of. What you put in this ministry here at the Faith Baptist Church is what you're going to get out of. All right, now the second mark of maturity. The second mark of maturity. The first mark of maturity is your diet. Milk or meat. And then the second mark of maturity is practicing, real profound, now practicing loving people. <laughs> loving people. That's not a collection of words, and I may have said it so much since I've been here, it sounds repetitious and mundane, but my dear friend, I really mean it. It's the hardest thing in the world that I've ever had to do. It's the hardest thing I've had to do to know that the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if Christ died, then we're all dead. I learned and am still learning that if I can let Christ work through me, I can love people like He did. Amen. I can't do it on my own. For me to stand up here and like the fellow out in the glass church in California that smiles and says love everybody. <laughs> I want to break the building, don't you? <laughs> I want to break out the TV. Yeah, it's hard to do. But Christ through you can love people like they should. Now, so let's begin to practice love. What does practicing love do? Well, it seeks to get along with others. That's what it does. You see, a mark of maturity, you can tell when somebody really loves somebody and tries to get along with other people. Children, what does children like to do? Did you know that... Uh, uh, my little Alex and Ivana got together the other day and uh, they had a ball together but I heard Alex just pitch the fit every time Ivana would put something in his poster or something like that or I said well what would you do she said Sarah said well daddy all I can do is get on you know what children like to do they like to fuss what parents like to do is get in and try to fix it when they need to stay out of it really. so, children like to fuss did you know what? You know what? Grown-up Christians like to do that are carnal. They love it. They eat it up. Wine, fuss, and carry on. Children disagree and they fuss. And but here's one thing children like to do. Children like to identify with heroes. What you need to do is put a hero in front of your child. You need parents, you need to put you and your wife and your wife and your husband. You need to be their hero. You, you, you need to be their hero. When they grow up, somebody said something uh, uh, to my daughter up in Crossville one day. And, but she got climbed down her throat. She said, my daddy don't lie. Well, I said, Jenny, I have told a lie or two in my lifetime. Just maybe one or two. <laughs> but you see what I'm talking about? My daughters went to bat for them. Moms and dads, you need to make the heroes in front of your children. You need to be the hero. They need to see Christ in you. Dads, they need to see you loving your wife and loving those children, loving them so much that you're a provider and, and treating your dear wife as a queen should be treated. Wives, they don't need to see you correcting your husband all the time. You know what you're producing if that happens in your life? You're going to produce some rebellious children. Watching the mother rebuke the daddy constantly. I've seen it in my ministry. I've seen, I've been in the ministry long enough to see babies born that are now 30 years old. And very rebellious because mom and dad could never get along together. We need to be the heroes. We need to be the heroes of our children. Amen? So the second mark of maturity is practicing love and seeking to get along with other, others. Uh, now again, the children love to identify with heroes, and so we need to put the right heroes in front of them. But then uh, the main hero we need to put in front of them is Jesus Christ. Amen. Because He is our example. He is love personified. He is everything that's good. He's everything that's right and everything that's holy. But we had these babies over here at the church of Corinth saying, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of so-and-so. And we ought to love Christ supreme. Amen. Put the 
right kind of heroes in front of our children. All right, now, again, each member makes his own contribution. Uh, as believers grow, they build the church. Turn over, if you will, hold your place in 1 Corinthians. Turn over here to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number uh, chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Now let's begin reading here in verse number 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and with the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildings fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. My dear friend, the church, of course, is a family, and the goal is mature. We're building together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, as believers grow, they build the church. Maturity shows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the family, of course, is the church. The goal is maturity. And then we get down to verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Verse number 9 said, You are God's husbandry. That is your God's cultivated field or God or garden. In other words, your God's farm, as it were. This church right here is a field that ought to bear fruit. We ought to produce a good crop. We're a field, and the goal is quantity, then we should cultivate the field. Amen. Plant the right seed. The emphasis, of course, is on God Almighty. And by the way, just let me say the Lord Jesus Christ, He's worth it. He is worth it. Everything we do should bring glory to God. He's worth it. Now, the laborers, the laborers, all we do as laborers is just set some things in order. And according to verse number 7, God is the source of growth. We set some things in order. What do we do to set some things in order? I preached a revival sermon here not too long ago. A, you remember 1 Kings chapter number 18, how that Elijah set some things in order? All he did was just set some things in order and pray and call down the fire of God and some things begin to happen. You and I put some things in order. We get up the first thing in the morning, we open our Bibles, and we get some nuggets for the day. That's what we need to do. Pretty profound again, isn't it? I told you, just get in the Word of God. We open our Bible, we get some nuggets of the Word of God, we use them, Lord, give me something, and send somebody in my path that I could witness to or talk with or help today. And we go through life. We come to church on Sunday, we put some things in order, we uh, sit in our pew, we open the hymn books, we sing a few songs, we give some announcements. All we're doing is putting a little order to the service. And uh, we take up an offering, and get the announcements and so forth like that. And then we open our Bibles to the text. And hopefully and prayerfully you're listening and taking notes and begin to apply the message. Just put some things in order and then ask God to begin the increase. By the way, He said He would Amen. in our text. That's exactly what, if we're the field, then our goal should be quantity. If we're the family, the goal should be maturity. And the field, the goal should be quantity. And God, again, is the source of growth. We are the only God's laborers. All we did was our assigned task. We don't need to be patted on the back for fulfilling our responsibility. But it's good to pass out roses. I, I, I idiots. Everyone likes to know they're doing a good job. And I appreciate our workers here at this church. I appreciate the faithfulness. Uh, of you that are here on Sunday nights and Wednesday. I appreciate the faithfulness of God and the workers that we have. Uh, God will bless our efforts. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But minister by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. So we all have an assigned task. Uh, he, by the way, even the faith that, uh, of the believers was a gift from God. We talked about that this morning. I can plant, you can plant, Brother Andre can water, Brother Dana can water. Uh, we can plant and we can water. Only God, in verse number 6, can make it grow. Amen. 
Look at verse 6. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Now there's, uh, there's three main lessons here. I'm going to give to you real quick. We're going to close. First of all, there's diversity of ministry. Diversity of ministry we're looking at in verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. One waters, one plows, one sows. We found that out. Time passes, plants grow, fruit appears, and other laborers enjoy reaping. So we have diversity of ministry. And then the second lesson right here is unity of purpose. Unity of purpose. No matter what work that a person is doing for the Lord, he's still a part of the harvest. Look at verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. One may be out here knocking on doors on Saturday morning. One may be uh, laid up in bed and can't go out knocking on doors. But you know what they're doing? They're sure praying for those that went out. They're laying there in the bed or sitting in the chair not able to get up and walk. Maybe like you are. But they're praying, dear Lord, please give them fruit for their labor. Bless the work of their hand. May there be one out there today that will respond to what they have to say. That will take a track and open it and read it. You see, everyone can be a part of this church. Every, there's unity of purpose. No one is greater than the other. The, the, listen, the head is not greater than the toe or the foot. Everyone works together. It's a body, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a body fitly framed together. And according to Ephesians chapter number 2, that groweth the habitation of God through the Spirit is what the Bible says. So we have diversity of ministry, unity of purpose, and then we have humility of spirit. Efforts apart from God's blessing would be failures. A puffed up attitude divides. Thinking that you're better than you really are is a very, very dangerous thing. Sometimes you'll get, a, if you're not careful, you'll get a reputation that exceeds your ability by thinking that you're better than you are. You get a reputation that exceeds your ability and somewhere along the way you're going to fall. You know what you're going to have to do? Start all over. Now here comes, here comes the goodness of God. God will let you start all over. Amen? Amen. We can start all over and go over. I had a missionary come to me some time back. We were talking about plans. And he said, Brother Rowan, he said, I have one thing that I need to do. He said, that's to reestablish my credibility. If we're not careful, we get a reputation that exceeds our ability. We're faced with temptations and trials. We may succumb to it if we're not careful. And you know what God will let you do? He'll just let you start all over. And you can start all over. That's one thing about being in the family of God. We can never be put out of the family. Right. We can, again, God doesn't make any jump. We're a, we're a royal seed. Amen? Amen. Alright, and then uh, of course, the conclusion there, fruit has in it the seed for more fruit. Eventually, more fruit, and then eventually what? After more fruit comes what? According to John chapter 15. Much fruit. Amen. More fruit, much fruit. And that's what we can see in our lives. And uh, my dear friend, remember this as we close. We've never had this opportunity before. It's a brand new opportunity we have in the ministry. The church is a family. The goal is maturity. The church is a field. And the goal is a quantity. Let's keep sowing the seed and asking God to send for you. Amen? Stand our feet, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God and the message. Lord, I pray that we take it to heart. Lord, as a result, it would be all we can be for Christ. Realizing our responsibilities to plant and water, and you said you'd give you the fruit. Lord, I pray if there's one here tonight, dear Lord, struggling with their uh, with just their ditch in life, Father. May they see today that they're part of the family of God and their faith. Big, big ministry here in Milford, Florida. 
for us to fulfill. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have an invitation as we sing and play. If God spoke to your heart, why don't you come tonight? Maybe you just need to come say, Here, my Lord, use me. I want to be used with God. What a wonderful God we serve. He'll use you if you're willing to be used. But in the ministry is what you're going to get out of it.